Good afternoon, and welcome to the 2018 Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. My name is Nick DeGancy, and I'm a first-year MBA student here at MIT Sloan. It's my pleasure today to introduce our panel, Major League Data on the Pitch, the Evolution of Analytics in MLS. Our panelists today are Devin Pluler, Senior Manager of Analytics for Toronto FC, Ravi Remanini, Director of Soccer Analytics for the Seattle Sounders, Luke Bourne, former head of analytics for Roma and current VP of strategy and analytics for the Sacramento Kings, and Jeff Agus, SVP of competition for MLS. Our panel will be moderated by Angus McNabb, executive vice president of North America at Perform Group, and the panel will run for 40 minutes. We will leave five minutes at the end for questions. If you would like to ask a question, you can submit it on Twitter using the hashtag Major League Data. Questions with the top mentions will be selected by the moderator. And with that, I'll hand it over to Angus. Thanks very much. I'm delighted to find out I'm now employed by Perform again um, <laughs> and expect the money in the bank account on Friday. Um, first of all, so Luke, we'll start with yourself. Um, there's a recent OptiPro forum in London, and you put up some thoughts on Twitter um, after this, a little bit of a wrap up and summary. And one of the things you put up that sort of piqued my interest was you said, smart analytical organizations are not built by having one or two smart people within them. They're built by having everyone across the organization strive to be objective and data-driven in their decision-making. Now, it's quite a bold statement, and post a sort of soccer-specific analytics conference, where do you feel we are with that in soccer right now? What was your experience with Roma and, and how that went there? Yeah, I think the, the current standard across sports, and this is maybe changing in baseball and basketball a little bit, but definitely in soccer, is that whether it's the draft room or whenever you're making a decision, it might go around the room to the, from the scouts to the uh, GM, and at some point someone says, looks at the analytics guy and says, what does the numbers say? And so the, the sort of analyst is the person, the sort of the numbers guy. And I think that, that, that people talk about sort of analytics and scouting as these sort of complementary things, but I think that's actually the totally wrong way to look at it. I think we need to think about analytics as something that doesn't sit beside, but something that empowers uh, everyone throughout the organization. And so if you think about the decisions that an organization is making, it's, it's on scouting, it's the games that a given teams, uh, the scouts are gonna go see, it's the food that we feed our players, it's the time we choose to fly, the time we choose to practice, um, the, 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 the setup in our weight room, whatever it might be, it, it, in my mind it makes sense that all of those areas uh, be driven by um, information and, and ultimately be data informed. And the truth is the data doesn't discriminate, right? The data just wants to be used and loved by everyone. Perfect. And Jeff, obviously slightly different than on the club side, um, sitting in cross responsibility with the league, with competition. I've worked at MLS for a number of years, been fortunate to do so, and you clearly are an analytics-driven organization. Um, who are the sort of the other people, as you say, the smart people in the room um, that are making these discussions and these decisions, and how does analytics play a role day to day for you guys? Yeah, we look. We try to make as many evidence-based decisions as we can. Um, I agree with Luke that the data is is uh, the foundation of where we drive decision making, but it has to be contextual. It has to be delivered in a way uh, that's relevant, um, has reliability. Uh, we look at data in different areas from youth development to the quality of our product uh, to re a recruitment strategy uh, with our teams. And so data is a, a huge component of how we look at making decisions, strategic decisions for the uh, good of the, of the company and the organization. And on the sort of the product quality and the benchmarking side, so when you're doing that, you're looking at MLS in relation to just inward with themselves and discussion with the teams, or what's the sort of side of that that you're doing, evaluating yourself in a global marketplace, which is probably different to other US sports? Yeah, it's always difficult to compare leagues against one another, uh, but we look at different areas of, of our business in terms of on-field product quality and try to understand what the gaps are between the best leagues in the world um, as a, you know, a, a data point that has a lot of data points underneath it, just goals per game as an example. Last year we had the highest goals per game of the top leagues in the world, including uh, Liga MX. I don't think that makes us the best league in the world, but it tells you something about goal scoring, tells you about who we have 
may tell you about who we don't have on the defensive end, uh, but over a five-year period, I think we are second only to the Bundesliga in terms of goals per game. So as an entertainment value, you can then go to market and talk about uh, that piece of it. But, but that's only one data point in a number of different data points uh, that you have to look at in terms of that gap between Major League Soccer and the, uh, the top leagues in the world. The vision of, of MLS is to be one of the top leagues um, around the world. Dev, um, we obviously worked together uh, at Opta, and then you went north to Toronto. I think you last spoke on a soccer panel here in 2016, and you said that at that moment you didn't think you could put a Sloan Research paper um, in front of one of your coaching staff. Do you think you could do that now, or do you think you'd actually be doing a disservice and not doing your job properly if you just put a paper in front of one of the guys that you're working with? Um, that's a good question. I, I I still can't do that, right? I, I, I wish that I could, but um, you know, ultimately, the it's it's not the responsibility of the the coaches to uh, be able to interpret this stuff. That's that's my job, right? Yeah. My my job is to uh, be aware of what's being done in this space, uh, understand what the cutting edge is. How do we you know try to get ourselves as close to that edge as possible? How do we take that stuff that's being done in a you know the 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 whole. Uh, you know, soccer analytics research space. How do I turn that into um, soccer language for our coaches? And it's my responsibility to have those conversations with the coaches, right? Now, like, I, I think it's it's kind of nuts to think that you're going to put these research papers in front of coaches. And, and maybe it's a, a question for Luke. Like, uh, could you could you put one of your 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 basketball research you know uh, you know things in, in front of your actual head coach? Is is that that's obviously not? I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> Not. Yeah, definitely not. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's uh, you know, and, and I'm sure Robbie has got a, a similar experience here too. Like, um, it, it's our it's our responsibility to synthesize, right? And we're yeah. translators. We're we're operating somewhere between the, the 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 math and the science and the soccer, right? So we're sitting here, and we have to kind of bridge these gaps. You know, Ravi, we were just chatting. You're saying that you have a an interesting approach to the way you do that from time to time with the coaching staff at Seattle that you've quite fortunate that you live quite close to Brian so you sometimes travel in with him in the car in the morning um, and so you're able to influence and, and have a discussion there that way. Uh, that's a good point. I think I, I'm lucky that I stay close to him and uh, I could carpool with him sometimes and always get that time with him where he's alone and try to get some thoughts from him in the morning. He's a morning person. I'm a morning person. So we always uh, ask some questions. I always prepare myself when I'm going to get a lift from him. And I try to ask those questions to him or put some seeds of thought with him. And, uh, and the same thing I do when sometimes I have something I want to share with him. I go to office early. He comes in at 7, so I try to be there before him. So And he always tells me before he leaves the office, he's like, Ravi, tomorrow, bright and early, so that type of stuff. So I use, it, I use that time to get some really thoughts that I want him to think about. Yeah. yeah. And that, how generally, I think, yourself and Devon, one of the things that you've certainly got an advantage is there's been certainly some continuity and not dramatic amount of change. And obviously, the, you had a change in head coach in Seattle, but Brian's been there for a long time. So how has that helped you guys, and, and how has your role really evolved since you were last on a panel in 15, and, and just generally from pre-season when you left Microsoft in 2012 to now? Uh, that's, a, that's a good good segue to see what has happened in the last, this is my sixth season, and the first time I joined the Sounders in the pre-season of 2013, all we had was a few Excel spreadsheets, there was no computer, they, he sent me, okay, there's a few sheets of data from training and some survey data from uh, wellness surveys. And from there, now we have a, an analytics platform for the sports science as well as for the recruitment and, uh, and the scouting. And the sports science thing is pretty much in steady state where uh, it, is, it creates all the training load monitoring reports and stuff. And the sports science team runs with it right now. And I spend a lot more time on the recruitment side. And I think the big thing that has changed is when I joined, there was not a good way to uh, incorporate data into decision making. There was data, we knew that, and there was not a good way to how do we incorporate all the information we know in a way that we can take up well-informed decision. 
I think right now there is a lot more, uh, a lot more structures and instruments there that I can get all the data required for to make a decision. And I, I think that's what we pride in ourselves in is that we'll try to use all the information available, whether it's perfect or imperfect. And in some cases, we may not have perfect information. In some cases, we do. And we try to incorporate whatever is available, whether it's numbers and data, or whether it's video, or whether it's a person having personal experience with the players of the previous, in his previous club. And we use all that. And I think, as uh, President Obama mentioned yesterday, uh, if I can change our odds or improve our odds from 50% to 70%, that's a win for me. Yeah. I would always go for that. And Dev, yourself, what does your week look like then as, a, as an MLS analyst? Um, so I sit between um, both kind of like organizationally and physically in the office, uh, between kind of our, you know, uh, scouting departments, our, you know, uh, video departments, our, you know, uh, AGM and, and GM offices, right? So it's a pretty, you know, close, close-knit area. And, um, and when I talk about like what does the analytics department um, look like, you know, you frequently get a question like how big is the analytics department? And something that you know, Luke, Luke said the other day was like it's really hard to count, right? It's it's unclear kind of um, you know how how you count people. Does people that are writing SQL queries, you know, count as uh, as a part of your department? You know, I don't know, right? Uh, does your does your video guy who's running some basic scripts count as an analytics guy? I don't know, but you know, those this is kind of growing and. You know, kind of where we sit is, you know, I, you know, I, I'm working on different projects with our opposition, you know, analysts uh, on on a, on a, you know, Monday, uh, Monday, yeah. Tuesday type of thing, um, and you know that sort of report gets compiled and, and sent off to the coaches kind of by Wednesday, um, and, and by Wednesday or, or Thursday, I'm getting questions back from them on, on, on certain parts of those the scouting reports and things like that. Um, and then, you know, once we get down to Thursday, Friday, even though we're playing the next day, like, there's very little I'm going to be able to do at that point. So that's actually kind of when I'm working on other projects, like with our, you know, uh, recruitment guys, um, you know, depending on kind of where we are in our recruitment cycle and things like that. Also depends on what time of the year we are, too. Or obviously, my, my schedule is much different uh, in season to out of season as well. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a quickly, um, th there's quite a lot of stuff going on on a weekly basis. And you were obviously, you said that you're physically loco located between GM and coaching staff. Luke, you had the experience of working remotely in your role with Roma. Um, and what was that like, just generally sort of being a little bit more distant from the training ground and the direct influence? And is it a regret that you weren't sort of physically based in the location, able to do more? Is it an advantage, that distance in some times as well? Or? Uh, I think it goes both ways. I think the immediate knee-jerk reaction is to say, yeah, it probably would have been more effective had I been on site. But uh, as I think about it, I was really fortunate at Roma to have some really smart people and, and really people that wanted to be objective in the way they made decisions. And that's on the scouting side, Alex Zeka and Francesco Bologna, but also performance guys, uh, um, Darcy Norman and Ed Lippi. Everyone wanted to use this stuff. So I didn't need to be the, the data oracle and this sort of re relates to what I was saying earlier. Really. I was just I was sort of helping them interpret how to use this data and then sort of, what I said before, sort of empowering them to, to do their jobs with this. So I didn't need to necessarily be the guy next door to them where they would sort of knock and say, hey, how do we how do, we do this? Because we'd already talked about this and they had, I had built tools for them that they could answer these kind of questions on their own. Yeah. Jeff, you've held the role of technical director um, with the Red Bulls before you went league side, um, probably in a time where the actual availability of data um, was nowhere near what it is now with the league and, and things there. If you have if you, to have your time over again, um, what would your approach be um, in the club space analytics and where, where would you even have your analytics guy if you have one reporting to? Well, that's a broad question, but um, I think the analytics are what drives a lot of the decisions from the general manager's position um, in terms of Everything from hiring, hiring your coach, recruiting, advanced scouting, um, sports sciences, how you keep players healthy. So it's sort of the foundation that lives under all of the different disciplines that come under the, the soccer operations piece of, of, a, of a club and how you use it, who's using it, what way they're using it, I think can make a difference, especially in a league like MLS where there's so, so much competitive balance that, um, just a, a goal or, or a different player that you bring in or a draft pick that you may pick could mean the difference uh, between a playoff 
and then a championship. So it's, a, I think, a huge driver of, of decision making along with um, subjective analysis that you bring in on top of that. And we'll, at this point, a couple of people have thrown questions to me, so very similar vein like that now. I think Sarah Rudd sent me a question earlier on, said that, um, and we'll go just down the line, if you had an extra 100 grand to spend in your budget, um, would you be spending it on better and more data, um, or would you be hiring more people at this point? So, Dev, we'll start with you. Do I have to go first? <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it's, a, it, it's a great question, right? And it is a real, real question that we're, we're kind of facing on a, on a regular basis, right? Um, you know, we want to, uh, we want to grow these analytics departments um, because, you know, obviously, and, and, and I'm sure Robbie's probably got a similar situation where, you know, there's a very limited bandwidth, right? You know, um, we don't have uh, the best data in the world, but we do have a lot of other, you know, uh, of data as well that is taking up all of my time, right? And there is a lot more stuff that I could do with the, you know, kind of existing stuff that we have. Um, that I think you know uh, can still make large differences. There's plenty of you know, kind of low-hanging fruit that we still have to pluck, right? Uh, but at the same time, we also want to stay on the cutting edge, right? So we, we need to know what's out there. We need to be reading research papers like Luke's and seeing how that applies in soccer, right? And uh, obviously, you know, we have to kind of balance those things, right? Um, hopefully, you know, the, the question isn't, uh, you know, one or the other. Hopefully, it's both. And I think if you're a good enough analytics department, uh, you probably have the opportunity to grow in, in both of those regards. Um, but also, you know, we're also not the richest league in the entire world. Every team has budgetary constraints, right? Um, but I also think that represents opportunity, right? You know, the players are the ones on the salary cap. The analytics departments aren't, right? These are places where you can make large investments that can make large differences, uh, the ways that you can set yourself apart from other teams, and I think are relatively, relatively cheap ways to do it. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a debate that's happening all the time. What are you doing, though? What, what are you doing? You spend it on data or people? Go on. Um, I, um, half and half. Right, okay. So you've got half a person, part-timer, and a bit more data. Great. Ravi? Uh, I'll take a little different tack here, I think. Uh, if, if, there is, if I'm there, or assuming there is an analyst, because it's always chicken and egg. If you're starting from zero, obviously you need an analyst, not yeah. the data. So if you have an analyst, and I would, if the data is much better than what I already have, I would probably go get more data, because I think that's where the power is. And, and I will find a way to mine that data. I think that will, I'll, I'll probably prioritize data. He's 50-50, if he's 50-50, I'll probably say I'll go 75 or 80% right. with data, yeah. So you get an intern then. So you've got, yeah, you've got an intern. <laughs> <laughs> Can't say that with students, eh? Uh, Luke. Yeah, I think condition on the sort of base state between the team being the same, if I think about basketball relative to soccer, um, we in basketball are just drowning in data. There's so much data, and and even when tracking data came in, most of the teams just said, "Okay, we're going to collect this. We don't know what to do with it. It's too big. We don't have the scales to deal with it, etc." Um, so in basketball, without a doubt, the answer I would have is people uh, over data because we're drowning in it. But I think in soccer, it's probably the other way around. That uh, uh, the baseline level of data, there's a long ways to go. So I would say data in soccer. Jeff, uh, you, even you've got it not necessarily at a club, but at the league in terms yeah. of right now. What, what would you, what would I think there's three areas, people, obviously, as Luke said. I think tools, so those people could use it. And the other third, I'd probably put into a, a high grossing fund where I could continue to make money and, and continue to reinvest in those first two. So I, I'd want some source of, of revenue to keep driving it. That's a very much a league answer right there. <laughs> <laughs> and so, well, we also, there's a couple of, uh, people mentioning their tracking data and what do we do? Luke, you've obviously written uh, a research paper that's here on open spaces and looking at, at space creation in professional soccer. So it's obviously something that gets mentioned on these panels before is that we don't get into the nuts and bolts of some higher level stuff. So if you could just give us a quick statement on that and, and what your paper sort of summarizes and then Ravi Devon in terms of where that, off having read it, would apply to MLS and, and your thoughts on it as well. Yeah, the credit for that paper really belongs with Javier Fernandez from uh, Barcelona. Uh, but the paper's pretty easy to summarize. It's using tracking data uh, in the league in particular with uh, Barca. Can we measure how players create space and how they create spaces of value, but also how they create space for their teammates? 
and Devin, Ravi, in terms of there are obviously limitations with data that you guys have and work with, and tracking data is something that's, that's really just starting to uh, become more commonplace with an MLS. Um, are you guys starting to do things with it? Where are you sitting on that? I would say that we've started doing things with it. We just started getting that data from last season, just yep. for uh, some of our matches, and I think that's going to grow for this season. Uh, We've started working on that, and, and one of the things that the paper showed us was we were in the right direction, but probably further behind. And that's, that's attributed to how much time we can devote it there, and that comes back to Devin's point of analyst versus, versus yeah. uh, data. Uh, but I think the, the tracking data definitely, one of the things that with the coaches or the criticism of current soccer data, primarily event-based, is, oh, you don't answer all my questions, or you don't answer, okay, how is he moving between the lines? Or where is the space? How is he occupying space? Or how is he creating space? Uh, or questions like that, there's a lot of, uh, or how is the back four shape compared to how are we defending? There's a lot of those information we can't get with the current, current data sets available widely in soccer. And so, so to answer those questions, uh, I think that that, in, that data is going to be very, very useful. And uh, I, w I will say this, uh, if you ask me this question again next year, here in the stage or outside, I will have a better answer for you. Doing more with it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, I agree with all that, right? So, you know, I, I think, you know, teams are right now working largely in an event-based world, right? Um, while some teams do have solutions for tracking data in their own leagues, right, uh, this event-based data is not going to go away for uh, recruitment purposes, right? If I want to scout somewhere in Europe or South America, right, I'm likely not going to be getting, you know, tracking data for those things. You know, I, I, there's, there's really no way I see with kind of the... Um, the, the climate here around data sharing and rights and things like that. I'm, I'm not going to be able to be able to do that, right? So there, there still is a, um, there still is a huge question in terms of what more can I do with event data, right? Because, you know, unless you're going to start, you know, doing some really advanced augmentations to it, right? You know, this is what we're going to be working with on the scouting side for a long time, right? Um, but at the same time, you know, I, I still have to talk to coaches, and the coaches will uh, frequently have questions in terms of off-the-ball stuff, right? Um, so we can actually, I, I think what we can do is start to use this tracking data that we have for our own teams and start to look at how does this, how, how do we, what do we, what can we learn from the tracking data that we can use to actually make our event data better in other leagues where you don't have that tracking data? Because you know the, the large criticism um, with a lot of the existing processes at this point is that there's really not very many great defensive me uh, defensive metrics, um, whether event ba event based or tracking based. But you know tracking obviously gives us a direction we need to move in because we, we think you know since you have a com more complete picture we, we think we can develop defensive metrics right, um, but yeah it's um, we're, we need to we need to see what we can learn from. And so I think this is where the role of the league comes in because if we can use economies of scale, if we can get all 23 clubs involved in using a specific tool and empower them to use a tool and they all use it differently, we can drive some of that, that pricing down to allow clubs to be able to use it. I think that's where the real value comes uh, from a league perspective. The difficult part is that everybody has to use it <laughs> and, not every, and you're trying to get 23 clubs to agree to one system or one platform, that's going to be a little a little difficult. Um, just to sort of go back to, to Luke's paper, I, th I found it absolutely interesting in terms of the next phase of what analytics are going to be about. From a league perspective, it's really interesting to see how space and creation of space is in different, uh, different components of temperature. Of uh, We have two teams at altitude in terms of travel, in terms of uh, number of games played in a specific amount of time. So taking that even one step further to create conditional um, parameters around that, I think would be absolutely fascinating for our league. And Jeff as well, so you, you mentioned there on the league side and the league role, so actually the three of you up here who play part as sort of the analysis committee that sits within the league as well. So what are the sort of common things that jump onto the agenda for those calls and, and things that you guys are discussing? 
Well, we, we created a uh, data and sports science subcommittee um, really on the back of the fact that all of our teams or most of our teams had now hired in this space. I remember we brought Brett Myers in a couple years ago uh, to speak to our head coaches and general managers when literally we had one or two people, one or two clubs who, who had people in that space. And now I think almost every club has a data analysis or a video analysis in some, some respect. So we felt that we could harness the, the quality of, of those people in our clubs to help the league continue to grow um, and con continue to analyze the game. And so uh, um, Devin is the chair for, for that uh, subcommittee, and it, it's, its role is to try to improve uh, the quality of the game. I think a lot of what we're focused now on is trying to identify panoramic or tracking uh, tools that, um, that will help the league and will help clubs and, and I think um, empower those analysts at clubs to come up with better ideas, better solutions to improve the overall quality of our game. You guys, that's um, I'm not sure pretty where COVID. We're, 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 we're going to in there. there. Um, uh, yeah, obviously, you know, there's there's a huge appetite uh, appetite for this. Um, we obviously just need to find the, the solution that makes sense for the most people, right? And and I think there's an interesting kind of dichotomy too. Is like you know we're we're looking to create our own competitive advantage, yeah. right? But we all but we almost need to help other teams to you know to uh, have these kind of solutions so that we can build better things on top of that as well. So, you know, I, I think that I, I feel a responsibility, and, and I'm not sure, Ravi, if you feel a similar responsibility, is that we, we do need to help other teams to some degree. We need to help bring other teams into the future to, to do kind of maybe what, what we're doing, right? Because I, I think it's worked out fairly well for us the last couple of years. Yes. You know, I, I think there's a, a decent amount of evidence at this point that this is the right approach. And I think that's, you know, um, you know, obviously winning things uh, goes a long way to convince people. But uh, yeah, sometimes we got to hold their hand too. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, with, with most of what you said, it's just that we need to bring, I mean, there's always the need that there will always be uh, 23 people and anything won't run at the same pace ever. Um, 23 different people, and uh, it's the same with organizations, and there will be some little behind, some little ahead. And I think, as you said, if you use the success as a, as a metric and show that, okay, they are successful doing this. And I um, mentioned earlier about all of this budget not hitting the cap. Um, so so that those are the things that we should probably push harder to get people on board and, and handhold early on to to come up to certain speed. Luke, has, has basketball lost that sort of collective desire to drive it because everyone now has access? Is it sort of pretty different that you're now all in your little silos and, and driving competitive advantage? Have you moved beyond like the needs of the collective there? Yeah, MLS is actually in a really unique position. If you think about soccer in, in Europe, um, it tends to be very sort of capitalistic. Every team is really on their own, uh, it's completely isolated. In, in basketball and, and American football and baseball tend to have pretty much an entire monopoly on that sport these leagues have. So for us in basketball, um, you know, if we, it, it's inherently a zero-sum game. If we make everyone smarter, it doesn't raise, it, it, it doesn't like raise everyone up together because there's a sort of, we already control, the league already controls the market in some sense. So um, whereas MLS on the other hand, you know, there's multiple competitors uh, around the league, or sorry, around the world. And so, it's true probably that if, if Devin or Ravi shares information with other teams, it makes them better. So it by, you know, you might make the argument that it makes them worse because of the nature of competition. But at the same time, there is a huge market share out there to capitalize. So if they can lift the whole MLS, they can actually create advantage for themselves by sharing information. And I don't know if there's any other league that has that same feature. Yeah, and I think uh, there's a difference. I think the NBA has a lot more money too, so it's, <laughs> it's easier to buy your own. Yes, <laughs> by your own solution, you know? Um, we said sort of the description of the panel, we said we'd touch a, a little bit on, on life. Now, we saw in the NBA a couple of weeks ago, Steve Kerr just threw the clipboard over to his players and away they went and coached themselves um, for portions of the game. So I doubt there's a lot of data and insight being used at that exact moment when, when that happens. But for you guys sort of... Uh, you outlined, Devin, your Monday to Friday kind of thing um, in a working week. What, what does a match day look like for you guys, and what are you supplying coaching staff and, and people there? Um, the typical, uh, typical uh, game day routine is I, I largely do nothing. 
um, which is which is great. I get to have a bit of bit of fun too, um, which, which which doesn't come very often. Um, but uh, largely, the, the the routine is around halftime, right? You know, what what sorts of things do the coaches want to know at halftime, right? Uh, how do we you know, quickly deliver this, um, not just like, and how do we physically get them the data, right? It's like, does it, you know, our, you know, it, I know, I know it's your stadium. It's a, it's a pain in the neck to get down to the to the locker room. So there's actually like issues like that, like you know, oh, make sure this guy holds this elevator for us at this time in the 42nd minute so we can get downstairs. Um, but it's also in terms of designing, you know, visualizations of, of certain things. Um, that the coaches want to see, right? And I, you know, I've let them kind of drive that process of, you know, what are what are your ideas? How do you what do you think that um, uh, what what do you think is is valuable? Uh, and and so we've gone and built you know various visualizations and uh, and different tables of data that they can quickly look over at halftime, right? Now, are these the most insightful pieces of information that I'm I'm giving them? Probably not. Uh, but what it is starting to build is um, a, a normalcy around this stuff. It's becoming normal for them to look at data at halftime, which I think is important. So, so maybe after a couple of years of doing that and they're getting more comfortable with that, maybe I can slip some more advanced stuff in there, um, uh, kind of some more maybe abstract you know, uh, metrics and things like that. But, but right now, it's, it's more about on the game day, you know, making sure they're looking at something. Um, and, and hopefully, it's, it's useful in some way. So we're I mean, we are really behind the advoca and advocating more data, more better decision making, uh, but that's not just off the field, that's on the field, and we're trying to pull uh, uh, FIFA and IFAB in that direction as well, uh, because for a long time they don't allow uh, data on, in the technical area, um, and we're trying to support clubs who want to make better decisions. Now, we don't want them to have video to contest officiating decisions, but if they have data that can uh, provide better information or guidance in terms of making a player change or understanding some of the biometric data on players through a given period of time, and they use that data to make better decisions on the, on the sideline to increase the quality of the game, we're 100% we're behind that. So we're crafting policy that will allow clubs to be able to use data, hopefully, in game. Right, so, so hopefully I'm not breaking any rules currently, right? We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I no, think I for us, something similar to, to Devin, I think we, what, what I do during the week is uh, we have discussions based on the opponent a lot of times. Okay, what is it what we're, we're trying to do? What, what is it we want to see from the opponent? And, we, and based on that, I have some things to track in the first half. And, uh, and, it's, um, and we, so I have a video analyst and uh, we, we have, and he does the coding during the game. And I make sure that the delivery is done to the coaches right as they come out at halftime. And, and I think it's, it changes from game to game. I will tell you that it, I don't know for sure it's useful every single game, but there are some games it's useful. Because there are some games where the coaches are, you know based on what happened in the first half, uh, if we play really poorly, I think like, okay, I'm just gonna go talk to them directly. Like there is not gonna be, or sometimes there is use for the data. And always I find it's easier to give that to our assistant coaches and then they propagate it to the head coach because head coach is very busy. Brian just wanted to get his points across. So. And, and you've obviously here the US media landscape, I think the one difference in soccer is there's, there's media obligations on that coach on the way to get to the locker room at halftime as well. Which That's actually a good thing in some ways, that it gives me one more minute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, well, yeah, and it, because it, the time is really at a premium. I think you, you think about it like when you are at the locker room at halftime, the time goes so fast. And, and by the time the players come in, it's already two minutes in. And the coach has to speak to the media guy, like saying what happened in the first half. He's going to say something there. And then he comes in. Uh, so there is very little time. And that's why I also think that um, just giving something just at the halftime is probably has limited use. Like, it won't scale that much because the time is always limited. I think, as Jeff is pointing out, if there is a way we can transmit that information as the half is going on to the, to the bench, then that can, that can give, because on the bench, they're doing nothing, except maybe they're standing up, the head coach, but the assistants are just sitting down, so it's always that they can take that information at that time. So that is where I think you can scale up more in terms of using data. 
Luke, just very briefly, is that was that an anomaly in basketball in terms of your experiences, oh. or it, even relating it back to Roma and the stuff you did there? Were you involved much on match day? Obviously, being remote, it's more difficult. Yeah, it's interesting that you bring up Kerr because there's this video that circulated uh, probably sometime last year where um, Steph Curry was on the bench and was a little bit down on himself, and Steve Kerr using the box score to say, "Hey, look, you yeah. haven't scored it at all yet, but look at the plus minus. Like when you're out there, the team does better, and, and it shows up. We can see it." And I think that's probably, so that's probably the way that our coaches are using that data the most. It's less to sort of make tactical adjustments. If you're trying to make tactical adjustments off 24 minutes, you're probably overreacting to randomness. Um, but it is a good way to say, hey, buddy, you're doing a great job finding open looks. Or, hey, you're, you're not getting around your screens. Watch out for this. You know, we see this in the data. That, so it's really less about making um, tactical changes than it is about as a, as a motivational tool for the players. So let, let's just go a little bit broader strokes and sort of the, the media acceptance of analytics. And I, I think there's a role in how soccer analytics glow, grows and its acceptance for the media. So good old Jeff Stelling of Sky Sports in the UK um, described his expected goals and said on it that it has to be the most useless stat in football. Um, he's obviously not here today. Um, I, I think everyone in this room will sort of disagree um, with that. Um, but, I, but I actually think like how the media do take this out of context and, and look at it as a single game indicator rather than sort of larger sample sizes for performance. But are, are we doing sort of a, a good enough job as the analytics community explaining this to them? Um, are we, do we sort of have a role in sort of the education of mainstream media as well? Devin and I had to spend a lot of time talking about how we shared a piece of chicken. Actually, yeah. I, mean, you know, I ate the whole thing, but apparently he ate half of it. I'm not sure how that. Yeah. <laughs> that went over a lot of people's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I don't, I don't know what the answer to this question is, um, but I, I have spent some time, um, you know, working. You know, when I was working with Opta, that there, there was, you know, uh, some a media side to this, right? And I think they've done a great job, you know, getting getting this stuff out there, right? And I think there's an argument that kind of any press is good press in, in this sort of thing, right? Um, you know, I do. I, 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 since now that now that I have a job, right? I, I don't really care how, how big yeah. it is. In, in fact, the, the smaller things get, and the less people talk about it, I think maybe the more advantage that I can have um, on, on the inside. Um, but also, I want you know the, the industry to grow too. Um, so it's a it's kind of a. A catch too. I don't know. Jeff, what about the league role in it? In terms of like, do you think the MLS have got a role in sort of? Do you have media platforms? Do you have publishing platforms taking more of a role in the education and, and creating more sort of analysts, more awareness within the community? Yeah, there's a huge educational piece in analytics and getting people to even understand expected goals was, I think, a huge shift. Um, and now that we've gotten, we've made that shift. I think um, helping them understand what the, matri the metrics will tell you and how they're being used. Um, you know, you'll typically see your shots, shots on target and possession and even distance run, and I, I have no idea what they mean together um, and what they actually mean individually. So I think it's trying to understand what, what's important, and I think it's different in every game. Some metrics might change in one game versus another, uh, but I think the education piece and getting media to understand it and why it's important and make it digestible so they can understand the rationale behind it and why we want to use it in a particular match or, or within a particular league um, is part and parcel to its, its success. So it's going to take time, but uh, it's going to take, take a lot of education to get, a, get the media um, to understand it in a way I think that everybody here understands it. And Jeff, just quickly before we go on to um, some questions from people that have been tweeting. Um, so Colorado um, now have uh, Edna Patel as director of player personnel. Uh, SKC hired Megan Cameron um, as assistant director of player personnel. And uh, Lucy Rushton's about to start her third season um, at Atlanta and uh, as head of technical recruitment analysis. Um, I'm not certain if it's by any great design or anything, but how pleasing is it that MLS are really leading the way with sort of women in front office positions. Very proud of, of, the, of the fact, and it's certainly not enough. And speaking personally, for, as a father of two daughters, uh, my daughters will grow up in a, in a different culture um, from the Me Too movement to what's happening on pay equality, where 
they would expect to get these jobs and they would expect to be paid equally. And I, I'm very proud that uh, women are playing a larger and larger part in, in our organization. And those three uh, women in particular are some of the best and brightest. I haven't had a chance to meet Ina, uh, but I hear very good things about her. Megan Cameron worked in the league office and is as bright as they come. Um, and, and Lucy is just a driving force. If you've ever met Lucy, uh, she's going 100 miles an hour a thousand times a day, um, and she's really been driving Atlanta's recruitment strategy. So it's been uh, fantastic to get uh, those women involved. And, and just the diversity component, just from a, a league standpoint, that is one of the core values of our league, um, and, and we really believe in it. We have, I think out of all the leagues, probably the most diverse league um, in the United States. We have over 70 different countries represented. So I, I think we're very proud of the fact of how, how diverse our, our league is in comparison to, to other leagues around the, the U.S. and around the world. Okay, I think we'll go on to now some of your questions because we've got just over five minutes remaining. So I haven't got names on these, so apologies if I don't credit you with the questions. So first of all, from someone in this room, is MLS's single entity structure limiting the competitive advantages you can gain through data? Oof. I think that's a whole, that's a whole <laughs> discussion in itself. Yeah. Um, I, you, look, you could easily see it limiting, but you could also see it expanding as well. I think under the structure we've had, we've gone from 10 teams in 2001 where we, we contracted from 12 to 10 uh, to 23. And in the last round of expansion, we had 12 teams, more than we had when we began, who, who want to buy in uh, to four spots. And so I, I, I think that there are a lot of parts of single entity that make a lot of sense. And there are other parts we reevaluate re every year to see if, if uh, we can expand them. Just look at the targeted allocation money coming in this year, which essentially doubles players uh, or clubs' um, salary caps. So, you know, there's, I think there's a push and a pull between ownership, especially some of the new owners who are very progressive in coming in and, and want to drive the sport forward. Uh, but that's a that's a probably a long <laughs> answer to a, a longer discussion. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that it's the opposite. I, I think it emphasizes um, yeah. uh, the value. Uh, you know, in, in a league with parity, smaller advantages make larger differences, right? And that's why I like to see home field advantage so so prominent in MLS. But also, like, you know, if if you're making an investment here, it's going to make a make a larger difference. You know, um, if I am, you know, you you can't make bad player decisions, right? It's every every single um, just because of the, the, the tight nature of our, our salary cap, you know, you need to nail every player rights at, at the different kind of buckets, right? And analytics helps us make those decisions better, right? Um, so yeah, I, I, I think that it's, it's obvious that it's a, uh, and, and if you just look at the number of MLS teams that are making investments here, like just as a percentage of the league, that represents way, you know, a much higher number than you would say if you're looking across the globe in terms of teams that are investing in this space. So I think the teams think it's an advantage. Well, next one. So what impact do you see analytics having on player valuation in MLS? Um, and have you seen that with you guys in particular? I suppose Rav and Devi, practitioners in it, um, affecting the sort of decision making within front offices. Uh, can you repeat the question? Please? So, what impact do you see on analytics having on player valuations? So, are you guys just evaluating the player, or when does the financial side come into that uh, when you're dealing with Garth and other people? I time? think we look at, as you mentioned, about the buckets of players. If it's a designated player, we have certain budget ranges, and obviously. You know, we can scout Messi or Ronaldo, yeah. but, but obviously that's not something we, who we can sign. But anyway, that's a simple example. We would like them to sign Messi if they could. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just putting that out there. He, he loves he, Seattle. He does. Yeah. You also don't need the analytics to tell you that Messi is good. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I think uh, the thing is that depending on the buckets we're looking at, we, we always try to find players somewhere close to that range uh, in terms of financials. And then then go, go ahead, do further detailed anal analysis and analytics. If a player is valued, say, 20, 25 million euros, it's hard to, for us to spend time investigating yeah. on him because we probably won't spend that money. And I think that's, that's probably how we look at it. You, you've looked at things more recently, Devon, in terms of we're speaking backstage, in terms of some of the trades that you've done recently, sort of looking at the various things that exist within MLS and, and what is of value to you guys is 
the sort of the TAM for GAM trade that sort of went down and things like that. Is that something that you become involved in when you actually look at it, or are you strictly on the playing side? Um, I would probably not say if I was involved in that. Right, okay. Um, so something, if you can be specific, you guys, so can we get an example of an analytical insight that you've acted on either in the office or on the pitch? You want to take this one, Robbie? <laughs> <laughs> what secrets can you divulge? In? Uh, I thought sharing information was uh, one of the <laughs> goals of this, uh, this, uh, this enterprise. But, but uh, I think we, we do look at a lot of things. Uh, uh, well, there's a lot of moments of where we, it's a sort of a slow drip of information, say, if I want to push a metric or if I think that something's useful, I start pushing it up slowly, like, okay, in every talk I have with the coaches or in every talk I have with, with sometimes with the players, that this is what you should be doing, show them video, show them, like, okay, if you do this, this, is the, this will help or increase your chance of doing things. Um, and so that's how, like, we try to push information and eventually it becomes subconscious and they, they'll act upon it. And that's one way of doing things. And I think we'll, one of the things we had success with last year um, was uh, uh, set pieces. Um, obviously, you, if you go back and look at the number of goals we scored, we probably weren't the best. But I think what we have, um, <laughs> uh, um, set pieces meaning corners, uh, <laughs> specifically. Uh, yeah, so I know Jivinko is good at free kicks. And stuff, so. uh, but. But that's one thing where I found some information, something about it in, in the data, and I showed it to the coaches and said, like, look, this is what we should be trying. And, and then after a few weeks, uh, maybe a couple of months, we actually started doing a separate drill in the training, uh, not like a gadget play or like a trick play. It's more basics of set piece stuff, changed some of the way we were taking set pieces. Yeah. So that's an example. Yeah, and just to kind of add on the first part there, it's like, you know, if there was a player that we had that I would say is an analytic signing, um, I, I wouldn't say that. Uh, but what I can say is that um, there, there really hasn't been, uh, and that's because it's just part of a process, right? Our, 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 our signings are not scouting signings, or they're not analytic signings, they're just smart signings that require both of these things. Right, so like if you were to like say, you know, that you know, I made a difference on this particular transaction, you know, uh, yeah. I did, but it was a, it was a very small part, or is it just a piece of the puzzle? And uh, each player represents a much different puzzle, and sometimes you're more involved on some players than you are on others. And, right, and that's where I think the imperfect information or data comes into play. There's a lot of times you are dealing with, uh, say, a league from Uruguay or Paraguay. We don't have any information from there, like any yeah. detailed information. So you are, have to use what you have available, send scouts there, watch video, and do things. Um, one of the things we, I look, I compare or always evaluate myself or our, my inputs is I look at, I have like a, I think it's called a confusion matrix. It's basically a false positive, false negative, true positive, true negative. Um, we always, I mean, depending on the type of signing, like the bucket, if it's a DP or a TAM or general signing. I have a different, we have different appetite for risk. If it's a DP, I don't want to be in the false positive, right? Yeah. I, would, I would be in false negative, I'm okay. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to miss a lot of good players, that's fine with me. But I don't want to, I wouldn't want to make a mistake there. But if it's a lower salary player, uh, lower end, I might take a little bit of risk because I know, okay, if this guy clicks at that price, that's a big advantage in a salary cap league. Yeah. So that's how we... I think we're, we're just about in extra time with a little red light flashing at me, but we always seem to finish um, with, if we're sat here next year, what do we want to see? So what's your hope or, I suppose, wish for the future of soccer analytics for the next 12 months? Just very quickly along mm. the line and everyone can leave. Ah, an another, uh, another MLS Cup in uh, Toronto between uh, Toronto and Seattle would be really happy for me. Could, uh, very quickly, between you guys, there was a bet on Twitter for uh, the first MLS Cup. Obviously, it's now one all. So mm. is this, if it happens again, finally going to be the um, playoff for each other's calculator? Um, uh, as you... I think I still owe mine to his. <laughs> um, uh, uh, so, uh, 
Sure. I right. Mean, we'll have so another calculators uh, on the line <laughs> for next year. But um, your I hope, Ravi, for it for the next 12 months. I think uh, I think we mentioned briefly earlier about the tracking data. I hope that we can get tracking data next year in terms of more specific things. And the fact that I already said I would have a better answer about the paper and how we're going to use tracking data. Um, I think I think to to the final thing. Uh, uh, I hope we can play it in Seattle this time, because you know winning away in MLS is pretty hard, and and we overachieved already winning once, one out of two. So, <laughs> Luke, yeah, I think it'd be nice. You know, it, um, these guys are amazing, but I think it's been the the same people on the on the panel, and that's largely because the uh, teams haven't fully adopted this. And I think in the last year or two, we've seen teams start to make new hires, and I hope that next year there'll be four new people sitting here that have just been hired into MLS and. Some of the people that are sitting out there are sitting up here. Terrific. Awesome. Jeff, here's Sam. I agree uh, with, with everyone here. I think uh, having tracking data is the foundation for providing more information to our clubs. Uh, but from the league standpoint, you know, we have, uh, I think we've got a good in-stadium um, atmosphere. We're averaging almost 22,000 people a, a game. Obviously, a lot of that's coming from Seattle and, and Toronto. Um, I think the next impact will have to be on the TV side and driving uh, our TV attendances and our, and our revenue because that ultimately is where all the other sports are in terms of why they can afford tracking and why they can do a lot of these things because they have the revenue streams. And so I think that for the, from the league standpoint, it's, it's that continual driving of, of TV revenue. Perfect. Well, thanks very much to you guys for uh, listening to us and thanks very much to the panel.